And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues, like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with, one, with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Pythagia and Pamphia and Egypt and in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and and Arabians, do we hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God? And they were all amazed, were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known to you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, and ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is which, that which we was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy." And I will shew wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon my name shall be saved. All right, and amen. Uh, thank you, Anthony, for that reading. <clears throat> Let's get into this. Um, church, what we believe is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. The faith that we have is awesome. Uh, years, years ago, I started to use that word a little more carefully, this word awesome. And... Um, I was blessed this week to stumble upon uh, some folks discussing what that word really means, and I was blessed in that too. Um, awesome is a feeling of the extraordinary, okay? Um, there's, a, there's a line in Acts, I've had it on the screen, that indicates that the people during this time were continually feeling this sense of awe, this sense of the extraordinary. And so I want you to think about that. You've, you've experienced awe in your life, no doubt. Um, man, God works in awesome ways. There it is. Um, recently, I recall feeling awe when I first saw the Rocky Mountains. Some of y'all have seen them, and you know all about them. Uh, you've seen mountains bigger than the Rockies, but I was standing at the foot of a mountain called Mount Quandary, which ironically means what? You know what quandary means? It means like perplexed. You know, not, not really knowing what to do with yourself. And that's how I felt. I felt so small. I didn't feel inferior or without value. That's not what I meant. I just felt small compared to what I was seeing. It was awesome. Uh, the universe is awesome. Oftentimes when I think of the universe, I watch documentaries. The girls think, oh, no, not again, right? Daddy's watching something on the universe on TV, but it's awesome. Your brains are awesome. I've tried to tell teens that for years, that their brains are awesome. 
Our brains do awesome things. Our brains try to make things less awesome. Did you know that? Our brains try to turn things that are awesome into normal things. That way we can function amid the awesome. That's a good thing, actually. It's the difference in a resident of the Rockies and how they feel versus a Middle Tennessee tourist like me, right? Our brains are awesome. But what our awesome brains do sometimes is they take awesome things and they normalize them. And so we have to fight against that sometimes, don't we? We have to fight against that. We have to remind ourselves that just because we've seen this, heard this, read this hundreds of times, it's still awesome. Just because we gather here and do this week after week after week, the reason that we're here is still awesome. So, so again, I simply remind you this morning, and you'll see it with me, our faith is awesome. What we believe is awesome. Attempt, try to be aware of the awesome nature of our faith. You might have just heard that read. You've heard the day of Pentecost read a hundred times. Some of you went ahead and started your nap. I don't, uh, hope not. But some of you are able to tune that out. You're able to tune out that story because what? You've heard it so many times. Try not to do that. At least not this morning and not through this story, or not through this study. Again, our faith is awesome. This chapter is awesome. Acts 2. I forgot the clicker. Um, and I didn't give you the notes, did I? Look at you. Acts 2 is awesome. It's awesome. Um, this is where I hear people say, this is where the Christian uh, faith, or, or faith, this is where the, our religion begins. Now look, I know what they mean by that. I wrote in my notes, this is where the Christian adventure begins. This is where it begins. Now, God has done a lot of work to bring us to Acts 2, obviously, right? But this is really where Christianity begins, and it's awesome. I heard it described in a lot of ways this week. Acts 2, these are some of my favorites. This is when God is giving His redeemed their new way of life. Sounded too preacher, didn't it? Think about it again. This is when God is giving His people their new way of life their new mission. This is where it starts. This is the launch of the Jesus movement. We were talking about those words a few weeks ago. This is when the Jesus movement is launched. This is when the fire starts, okay, or the spark that starts the fire. This is where we see it. I heard it described this week as the wind that launches the fleet of ships. I liked that. This is where it begins. This is the restoration of the kingdom, or at least part of it. You remember what the apostles were real anxious to ask Jesus? When, Lord? When, Lord? When is, the, when is the kingdom of Israel going to be restored? Acts 1, verse 8 or so. This is it. At least part of it. A type of it. You remember I said they were like kids asking, are we there yet in the car? Well, guess what, boys? We're there. This is it. Again, it's awesome. This was probably my favorite. And this might go, phew, but this is so cool. What we see in Acts 2 is the complement to Jesus' ascension. Now think about this with me, okay? In the ascension, what happens? Jesus goes up, right? Or out, or wherever, right, David? In the ascension, think about this, earth goes to heaven. But in Acts 2, what happens? You see it? Heaven comes to earth. Isn't that cool? Are you awed? Isn't this awesome? Amen. Let's, t- let's, let's, let's get to it, and then we'll work through it. And I don't even know what's going to happen this morning. Like, oh man, such a good week to be in this study. Because I felt inadequate. I felt overwhelmed. I thought, how in the world can I talk about such a chapter? And then the whole chapter is about what? The whole chapter is about God equipping us to do His work. Such a, good, such a good one for me this week. Let's build back to it. The apostles had diligently waited for days. They had diligently prayed for days. We talked about this two weeks ago. We talked about waiting well. Such a good lesson for me. Lord, help me to wait well. Okay? The disciples of Jesus had done that. They had waited well. They had prayed. They had obeyed the Scriptures as best as they understood them. So thankful for that. And then it happened. What happened? 
Acts 2 happened, okay? Awesome things happened. Acts 2 is filled with awesome, with, with awesome things. And I've wanted to explore and, and go on tangents with each one of them. But remember, a few weeks ago, I said, we're, we're going to try to dig into what? Principal messages. Principal messages, okay? We're, we're, we're going to try not to miss the forest for the trees. There's so many awesome things going on here. Okay, so this is the principal message, and you may be a little like, oh man, with it, but I don't want you to be. Oh, I want you to be excited about this. I think that the principal message from Acts 2, and we'll talk about it a lot, but I think the principal message is this, is that God keeps his word, you guys. And he does so in unimaginable and unforgettable ways. God keeps his words, and God has promised his word is that you will be equipped for whatever you need to bring him glory. You will be does that, do, do you go to sleep on that? Are you sleeping on that statement? Look, make it, let it mean something to you. You feel inadequate. I feel inadequate. I can't do this. Seven years ago, I don't know what I was thinking. How could I do this? Guess what? God promises to equip you with what you need for His work. He promises it. No matter how, how unworthy or inadequate or messed up you feel, this is the promise of God, and this is where our story begins. That's the principal message of Acts 2. Okay? I hope that intrigues you. We can't overlook that. We can't get too distracted by the things that we won't, I won't understand. But this is the principal message. It's so good. Again, let's get to it, and then we'll dive into it, okay? This is the Gospel. This is catching us up to Acts 2. This is simple. I try to, I've tried to state this simply in various ways. Here's the Gospel. This will get us to where our study is this morning. Are you ready? There was a man named Jesus from Nazareth who was crucified. What does that mean to you? You go to sleep on that, right? Because you've heard it so many times. What's that mean? Jesus from Nazareth was, was crucified. Well, let me tell you why it means something. Because this Jesus had extraordinary claims. There's that word. He had extraordinary claims. He claimed to be God's perfect human. He claimed to be fully what God desired for humanity to be. He claimed that His way was the only way. He claimed that He is the Savior. He was the Savior. Indicating that you need saving. Now, 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 that message was really great for people who were humble and hurting and who needed help. They liked that message. They followed that message. But guess what? For the proud and the arrogant and the people who thought they were always right, they hated it. What do you mean we need a Savior? What do you mean your way is the only way? And so what'd they do? Back to the statement. This guy named Jesus from Nazareth, a nowhere town, was killed for, for, for these claims. But, but why, why, why are we still fo trying to follow this dude? Why are we here today? Because guess what? He died and the story is he came back to life. He resurrected. Death was reversed. And people saw it. We're here today because of eyewitnesses who saw this. And they, and they told about it. And they wrote about it. And we're here today because of that. Isn't that wild? Like, again, let yourself be awed for just a minute. I know you come here every week. Love you. Thank you. So glad you do. Keep coming back and bring people with you. Right? This is good. But don't, don't let your brain do what your brain tries to do. Don't make this ordinary. This is extraordinary. We're here today because of this. Okay? <clears throat> he was killed. He was crucified. But there were eyewitnesses to his resurrection indicating that his claims were true. Indicating we got to listen now. Like, what kind of person can defeat death? All right? What he said was right. And all of what he said was right. And his way was right. And it's challenging because we, we, he was a person of peace and he was gentle and he was forgiving and he loved people that hated him. But God raised him up again and he put an end to the agony of death. And he had this really cool promise. You ready for this one? This really cool promise. Again, this word that God keeps is that this wasn't just for him. That's what this guy claimed. You know one of the most popular verses in all of the world, right? For God, say it with me, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten, His one of a kind, unique Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but also have this gift of everlasting life. You see that? That was His claim. We follow His way we get, to, we get our death reversed too. We get new life in the forever home of God. Does that sound good to you? 
Amen, right? Why is that so good, church? Because God is so good. Do you see this? Acts 2. It's time. Like, it's, it, Acts 2. What we see in Acts 2 is the spark that starts the fire. It's the wind that blows the fleet. It's the people who said, this is it. This is what everything is about. And now it's time to go and proclaim it. To witness it, okay? This is how I worded it. I think this is the next slide. Look at this. Camp out on this with me. What we see in Acts 2 are passionate and empowered believers beginning their witness of Jesus. Beginning their witness of God's way for restoring heaven and earth. That's what we see in Acts 2. Isn't that cool? That is cool, isn't it? All right. And so that can be overwhelming. It's overwhelming for me because they started this work and Jesus' followers are are to continue it. Let me say that again. They started it. Our mission is to continue it. And that can feel overwhelming, right? So this is where the lesson becomes so good. What's the principal message? Wait a minute, God. You've given me a mission of restoring heaven and earth through Your Spirit by following Jesus. And that's, and that's what all of this is about. And so now I have something to do and that's so overwhelming. How can I do that? The principal message of Acts 2 is what? God has promised. God keeps His Word. He will equip you with everything you need to accomplish this task. Everything. You're not inadequate. You're not unworthy. You have a purpose. This is so good. And so let's be odd. Let's be odd in this. That's not like ODD, but that's kind of true too, right? Like A-W-E-D. This is where it starts, you guys. You care about heritage. I know you do. I know you do. I know we do. We care about heritage. Heritage is one of our greatest assets, but also one of our greatest problems. Boy, we just, we can't let some of this stuff go, right? But then also it's made us who we are. Look here. This is our heritage. This is where it starts. This is our story. This is it. Let us be awed in this story. Pentecost. Let's talk about it. All right? Back in the text with me. Let me just give you some cool factual stuff that hopefully you'll love and then we'll wrap it up at the end, bring the kids in singing. Okay, some cool things about Pentecost. Pentecost probably doesn't mean a whole lot to you. You may be most familiar with this word in regard to like Pentecostalism and but, but, but let's just camp out on the word in the text right now. Pentecost is a reference to a Jewish holiday in this text. You probably know that. Okay, but let me tell you some cool stuff that I didn't know. I grew up in it too, okay? But this is some stuff that I hadn't always know, known. Uh, Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. What's that mean? Passover is when the, you know, when the, when the, when the Israelites were in, enslaved in Egypt. You remember? And they were told to kill a lamb and put the blood over the doorpost and the angel of death passed over. That's not our lesson for right now. But, 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 but so they celebrated that throughout their their lineage, right? That's called Passover. Well, 50 days later, they found themselves at Mount Sinai. This is really cool. You'll see all kinds of parallels when you study this. What happened on Mount Sinai? Moses went up, and what came down? The law of God, right? God's got Moses went up, the guidance of God came down. Isn't that cool? Okay, so 50 days after Passover. Now, in the time of Jesus, it, it was it had evolved into a harvest festival. We can check into some of that here because we're country folk, right? Like, Harvest Festival. Pentecost was a celebration of the coming of the summer harvest. When Jews from all over the known world would bring their first fruits, okay? And they would offer them to God for for God to bless the coming harvest. Some of you know this story. And you can make a connection there. Think about that. They bring the first to God and, and ask God to bless the harvest that is to come. Isn't that cool? The Bible's cool, you guys. Have I said that yet? The Bible is cool. It's really cool. And so anyway, that was Pentecost. I won't talk much more about that. Um, so many cool things. But here's the point. Again, I think the point, and I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, I just study this stuff and I try to figure out the, the main points, okay? So I think this is the main point that Luke is trying to emphasize. The main point is that there were a lot of people, a lot of Jews, that's important, A lot of Jews from all over the known known world had gathered in Jerusalem. That's the main point. That's really important. 
Okay? Uh, I nerded out on this a little bit, and so probably wasted some time. Population of, of Jerusalem is probably around 60,000, according to Roman census during this time. And estimates are that the population could increase by as many as four times during this holiday. So think about that, right? A city can go from 60,000 or so to 60 times four. 240, 240,000, I don't know, <laughs> right? Yeah, a quarter million. Thank you, Philip. That's a lot of folks, ain't it? That's a lot of folks. Of course, my mind just goes. I, I used to, some of you know the story. You know that at the end of the chapter, how many, are, how many repent and are baptized and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? How many? 3,000. See, you know this stuff just like me. I used to think, well, that was probably the whole city then. Oh, man, this is a pretty small amount. Oh man, why are we doing this? How cool is it? How awesome is it that we are here today following a man who has changed the world more than any other man who has ever lived. And the movement, you guys, was small. It started small. And we're here today doing this. Man, I love this stuff. Our faith is awesome. I heard a guy this week say that it started as a, as, as, and I, and I get this, I get this phrasing. He said, our movement started from a, from a cast aside, thrown out group of Messianic Jews. This is where it began. This fire, this spark, this wind that launched the fleet. Ah, so good, so good. Again, there's a lot of people in Jerusalem, a lot of people. All right. I've tried to emphasize for weeks now God's desire for Israel to know His gracious plan of redemption. Preacher, right? One more time. I've tried to emphasize for weeks now God wants Israel first to know His plan for their restoration. Okay? I stood right here a week ago. I reminded you of how messed up they were, how oftentimes they rebelled and forgot. God is so gracious and He is so good. He has these 12 men who represent Israel who are first to proclaim to Israel that you are not forgotten. You are in fact redeemed and restored. All right, So it's really important to know that Pentecost is a gathering of Jews from all over the world. Proselytes. All that word means is Gentiles who had converted to Judaism. So that's what's going on. What better time to announce this? Think about it. When a lot of Jews from all over the world have come to one place and they don't intend to live there forever, but they intend to what? Go back to their homes. You see how cool this story is? For this to, to in order for this to stick, in order for this to last, in order for this to be a story that changes the world, something awesome is going to have to happen, right? Something awesome. This, Follow me, if you will. Again, do you, do you see where I'm going? In order for this to be a moment that changes the world, in order for Acts 2 to be a moment that changes the whole world, something awesome is going to have to happen. Something monumental. Something powerful. Something that changes everything. Maybe kind of like when the wind of God blew over the chaos at creation and ordered everything. Y'all keep following me. Or maybe like when the fire came and, and, and this, this bush all right, was consumed with the fire of God and Moses was told, hey, go lead the people out of Egypt and bring them back to this Mount Sinai. Something as big as that. Or maybe like when Solomon had completed that temple building and he prayed and then the fire of God came from heaven and filled the whole glory of the temple. Something as big as that. Or maybe like when Elijah right, was contesting with, with the prophets of Baal, and all of a sudden the fire from heaven came and ignited that altar. Something as memorable as that is going to have to happen. You want to read it? You ready? Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered in one place. Probably a reference to that 120 from earlier. 
And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire distributing themselves. And they rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Say what? I have tried to embrace, more and more, I have tried to embrace the strangeness of this faith. That's okay. Like, that's okay, I, I, I think. I hope that's not offensive to anyone, for anyone to hear. This stuff is strange. This is weird. I hope you know what I mean. I don't use this word anymore a lot because I think it didn't sit too well, but it's kind of crazy, right? This is our faith. What just happened here? Okay? Again, I've heard this story for years. I've heard it read. I've heard it t- called the beginning of our church and all that. And, and, and it's become so easy for my brain to do what my brain does and just tune this out and keep reading, right? And, and camp out on our little pet doctrines that we want to hit people with. Sorry. Back, shouldn't have said that. Maybe. Like, just embrace this for just a minute. What's going on here, right? After days of waiting well in fervent prayer, people are sitting in a room, perhaps 120 or so, and suddenly there's an incredibly loud and violent sound of rushing wind. The word there is like this word of like violent wind sound. Any of you ever been through a tornado? I haven't. I've, I've... I got woke up a couple times this week in the wind. It was, I was really thankful. This week was extraordinarily windy. The week that I'm getting to study this. I thought that was cool. Some of y'all have lived through that. You've been in a house that's been destroyed. Anybody ever lived through a hurricane? You, were you one of those that should have got out and didn't, right? Like, so, so put it on par with that, okay? Um, <clears throat> fire. From heaven, fire from above, coming down, splitting, or whatever the language indicates, resting above people. Um, Tongues has always confused me. What in the world did that look like? This might help you, okay? The the these fire, this this fire represented language, represented tongues. I think that's a better way to understand it. Did it look like a tongue on fire? I don't know. Maybe kind of. Language represented as tongues. No, I said that wrong. Language represented as fire came down and rested above those here. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? There's neat language it might connect to this. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit descended as a what? As a dove. Do you remember this? So maybe kind of, maybe that goes together. Okay. Language came down as fire and rested upon them. Now look here. What are y'all going to do in this room if that happened all of a sudden? Right? we got a great security team here. A great one. But y'all going to be outmatched. Okay? I, I would be scared out of my mind. Right? This is our faith. This is what we believed. All of this happened... But the house was not destroyed like in a violent storm. Some of y'all are tracking me, okay? The house they were in wasn't destroyed, but, but a building system was destroyed. Anybody tracking me there? Maybe not. A system that was established around a building and a temple was destroyed in that wind. Okay? Nothing caught on fire, literally, when this happened, but a fire was lit, was it not? Some of y'all are tracking me here. Isn't the Bible cool? All right. <clears throat> the result of this was a powerful, unforgettable event. And, 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 and what happened? These individuals were given this ability to speak language. Languages that they had not studied, that they did not previously know. Now, why would that be the gift of the Holy Spirit here? Oh yeah, Pentecost, right? Let's keep going. 
The Holy Spirit had descended upon them, and this was the power that they had received that Jesus had promised back in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. This is what Jesus had commanded them to wait for. Again, the event that ignites the Jesus movement. Here we are. Okay, my favorite way, some of y'all, this won't hit you like it hits me, but my favorite way of hearing this event described is, is the marking of temple space. I heard that a few times, and I love that. What does that mean? God is marking out His temple space. Okay? In the Garden of Eden, I, I've, I've got lessons I've talked about on this. It's one of my favorites, this idea of temple throughout the Bible. Okay, temple throughout the Bible. The Garden of Eden was a temple. It was a place where heaven and earth came together, where God and man were together. Mount Sinai was reflective of a temple, okay, a place where God and man came together. The temple, duh, duh, right, was this idea of a temple, a place where man could go and encounter God, God would come and encounter man, okay? This is a, this is a marking of new temple space. It's just so cool. Our faith is so cool. Thank you, God. This is a marking of new temple space. And where has God descended? Who has God descended upon? You got it. Man. Man has now become this temple. Do you see that? This plan of God from beginning is being fulfilled by these believers in Jesus. The Spirit of God is resting upon His people. And then you see that, that theme throughout the rest of the New Testament. Are you following me? Some of you know that theme. This idea of man and God. right, Or man being God's temple. Um, I call this the old union verse. Some of y'all have heard me do this. Do this. Go to 1 Peter 2. I didn't put this on the screen, brother. You're off the hook. <clears throat> Got a little bit of time. I'm going fast or faster. Some of y'all thinking, yeah, right, you ain't going fast. Look here, I'm trying. Um, 1 Peter 2. I love this. Again, I've got this marked as the old union verse. We're a building of stones, by the way. If you, I hope you talk to people about old union in town. You'll talk to them about you know, coming to worship with us, this and that. When you get to the part that says we're the building with the rocks on it, they usually say, oh yeah, I know that building, right? I love this verse. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 4. Coming to Him, coming to Him as to a living stone which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also have become living stones. I think that's a reference to we are now this building, this living building that is home to who? Keep reading. We're being built up as the spiritual house for a holy priesthood, this idea of connection to God as priest, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus. Do you see the idea there? It's, it's what we're seeing back in Acts chapter 2. I could take you to Ephesians 2. I could take you to Romans 8. We could go to a lot of places and see that theme. 1 Corinthians. The idea in Acts chapter 2 is that this building system, right, it's being destroyed. Do you remember what Jesus told that woman at the well? Some of y'all do, right? You're with me, right? You remember what Jesus told the woman at the well? She's upset. She's upset with the Jews, right? Jews have mistreated those Samaritans, and Samaritans ain't been real good either, right? And so she's upset with Jesus. Who do you think you are? You're the ones that think you got it all right, right? And Jesus is pleading with this woman, look here, woman. There is coming a day when we will neither worship on your mountain or at Jerusalem. There is coming a day when, when you will worship the Father in what? In spirit and in truth. And such are who the Father seeks. Do you remember this? Do you remember that? That's the first lesson I taught when we didn't meet back in March of 2020. Don't even want to talk about it. Don't want to even bring it up. But I'm thankful that God put it on my heart to tell you guys that when building systems crumble, we are still the church. We are still the temple. Do you remember this? This began in Acts 2. Isn't that cool? Oh, it's so good. Let's keep going. I ain't going to get very far this morning, but that's okay. I'll do uh, Peter's sermon and the response next week. Lord willing, God, this is so good. Verse 5 of Acts chapter 2. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men of every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, Anthony, I love your translation. i got to figure out whatever that is because I liked what yours, how yours was reading. Uh, devout men, every nation under heaven, when they heard this sound occur does that mean they heard the wind or does that mean they heard uh, the people speaking the languages 
Think on that. I don't have an answer right now, but it's neat to consider. They heard a sound, okay? The sound, the noise, the commotion, I'm not sure. The crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Hey, friend, like those guys are Galileans and I'm hearing them in my language. I, 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 same, I'm hearing them in my, you see what's going on here? They were amazed, they were astonished. They said, how? Behold, are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each hear them in our own language to which we were born? And then there's that great list. You did great. Okay, Luke did this with intention. He could have just said there were people from all over the earth, but he didn't. He's trying to make a point here. Parthenians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, whatever Anthony said, Pamphylia, Egypt, the districts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans, Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. They were all, they, and they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. There's that word quandary saying to one another, what does this mean? But others were mocking, saying they are full of sweet wine, okay? So many things we consider. They're re are y'all ready? They're ready. So many things we could consider here. We're going to do that. Give me, give me a week or two, and we're going to talk about some of these things, talk about Peter's sermon. Let me just put some things on you right quick, though. You okay with that? You still with me? Um... I discovered that it may be more than just the 12 who were speaking these languages. History has indicated that for a long time, actually. Um, the Joel prophecy is interesting to me. Anthony read it for us, that men and women, sons and daughters would be prophesying and so forth. Think on that with me. Not a principal message, but very interesting, very interesting to consider. How'd they know these guys were, these people were Galileans? That's also interesting to me. The quick answer is their dialect. Maybe. You know how we talk Tennessean, right? Some of y'all don't, but that's okay. <laughs> um, some suggest, and I like this one a little better, some suggest they knew they were Galileans because of a stereotype. And that really fits into this message, if that's true. Galileans weren't considered to be too much quite often. Rebellious, uneducated. What I say the principal message is, God has promised to equip you, you, you with everything you need. I don't care what part of town you're from. I don't care what your last name is. I sure don't care if you're a boy or a girl. God has equipped you for what you need for His glory and for, your, and for His work. I love that. Did they say, those are just podunk Galileans, yet they're speaking languages? Maybe. Luke is definitely trying to indicate to us that these are people who have come from every direction on earth. That's what he's trying to do. If you map out those areas, you'll see north, south, east, and west. Isn't that cool? You'll see all of them. Modern day Iran, Turkey, Egypt, Libya, Italy. You'll see it all. Saudi Arabia. You'll see it all. That's what Luke's trying to do. This is so important, okay? And the truth is, they probably all knew a little Greek. And if they're Jews, they probably all knew a little Aramaic. So Greek and Aramaic would have maybe worked. The miracle is what? They're hearing their native tongue. And they're thinking, how and why? What does this mean? Well, I hope you are seeing what it means. It means that this faith is awesome, and that this faith ain't confined to one place on earth anymore. It's, I have told you this, I know I've told you this for a long time, every time you see everyone in awe in Scripture, circle it, camp out on it. All right, uh, you, you read it, Anthony. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Did you hear that? Every, every tribe and tongue of earth. Okay? Uh, repent and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I can quote that part. The next part is something like this. And this promise is for you and your children and your children's children as all or as all as are afar off. Isn't that cool? That's what's going on here. Think on that with me. 
Okay? I could give you some more things that you'd wonder about. I wonder who was being accused of being drunk. We say the apostles really quickly, but was it? Or was it these devout men who were spreading this news that they were here in their own languages? Does, is that cool? Does that really matter? Does that awe you? I hope it does. I hope you are, yeah, open that Bible and say, what is he talking about? Like, get in there and look at it with me. This is good stuff. But this is what I'll leave you with as we bring the kids in. Are you ready? What were those languages talking about? What's the message that those people were inspired to, to, to start talking about, right? Look at verse 11 of chapter 2. They were spreading the what? The news of the mighty deeds of God. Look here, church. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. I love you guys. Come on in. We got a new song for you. We've been learning it a little bit. It goes, on, it goes along really well with this lesson. Some of you in here know it. We'll try it as the kids are coming in, as Dad's coming up. And then I'll, uh, I'll wrap us up. Maybe not the best time, but it is a good time, right? Yeah. Let me hear you, ladies. <clears throat> I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you. Hope to feel something again. I could just sit. I could just sit and wait for all your goodness. Hope to feel your presence. I could just stay. I could just stay right where I am and hope to feel you. Hope to feel something again. I could hold on. I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe, I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home, never let these walls down. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher. You have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You lead me, Lord. I could hold on. I could hold on to who I am and never let you change me from the inside. I could be safe. I could be safe here in your arms and never leave home. Never let these walls down. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You lead me, Lord. I will be your sword, I will be your sword all my life, so let your mercy Light the path before me. I will be yours, Lord. I will be yours for all my life, so let your mercy light the path before me. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you will lead me, Lord. You have called me higher, you have called me deeper, and I'll go where you So that's the kind of stuff we learn at Evangelism University and other places, and the kids come back and they get all excited, and then I just I cr I crumble um, when things just line up so well, and uh, 
And I find myself thinking, God, can I like even feel you or see you? Or and I find myself so wanting this Acts 2 experience. And I'm so done with hearing how everybody tells me how that's supposed to be. I just want to consume it and read it. And church, what's wrong with us if we don't want awesome things? Like, anyway, I'm not making any sense. Like, so you know what? I don't know what God promises uh, all the time. And I don't know how that He is still working sometimes. And I don't know if everything about the apostles' experience is for us or not for us. I don't know. But this is what I do know. This is what I do know. That they were using those languages that day and they were speaking the mighty deeds of God. And I can do that. I don't need... I don't need um, language. Um, maybe you do sometimes in your life. Maybe God will do something. I don't know. But like... Uh, God has given me everything I need. That's His promise. And if this is where it starts, it's my story. And He's given me the strength, and He's given you the strength, and He's given you the power. He's given us the power to continue it. They heard the mighty deeds of God spoken that day. And you know what? Peter could have stayed in a boat a long time ago, like we talked about in the teen class. He could have stayed in a boat. He could have stayed comfortable. You can stay here, and you can stay comfortable and rest in the mighty arms of God who loves you and will care for you. Or, or you can believe that God is who He says He is and does what He says He'll do and that we've been called. We've been called. Their calling is our calling. Maybe it looks different. Maybe it doesn't. But their calling is also our calling. We're going to sing for your encouragement. And uh, I, I, hope, I hope that you're feeling the awesome nature of our story, our heritage. Okay? If you want to respond to it, please do. Let's sing. <clears throat>